Hello and welcome to the Drew Expanse. I'm Mitch the Quack and I hope you're having a less quack day than myself. Today I'm going to be talking about what I think the old gods are, and I'm going to attempt to make this explanation as short as possible, as every time I attempt to write this script, the length just goes out of control. In World of Warcraft there are a lot of different ecosystems in the physical universe, from Ashen Vale to Stranglethorn Vale, Winter Spring to the Swamp of Sorrows. All of these ecosystems range in various different ways due to environmental factors enacted upon them. They are very similar to IRL ecosystems in that regard. Now, unlike the real world, World of Warcraft has magic, and magic does affect ecosystems. Two of the most extreme examples of this phenomenon are Felwood and the Seen Grove. As the name would imply, Felwood has been touched by Fel magic, and the results are quite obvious. In a similar fashion, the Seen Grove within the Nexus has practically been drenched in arcane magic, and once again shows the effect of magic on ecosystems. For a more nuanced demonstration of how magic and environmental factors affect ecosystems in World of Warcraft, I would highly suggest flying around Draenor. Each zone and certain subzones within each zone demonstrate how diverse and varied ecosystems can be when affected by certain magics and or events that have shaped a world. With this basic concept established, do I think shadow magic, the magic expressly related to the old gods, can have the same effect on the ecosystems of World of Warcraft? Frankly, yes. The obvious proof of this is the nightmare. Now, at this point I haven't actually gotten into the old gods, I've just re-established a very basic concept that has been in World of Warcraft since the beginning. The reason why I've done this is because, when coupled with the next concept, the old gods and Azeroth will suddenly make a lot more sense while simultaneously becoming an incredible enigma. Spore Mounds, the living ecosystems. To cut a very long story short, when Durian Ore came into existence, the plant life and plant creatures of Draenor became the apex predators of the planet. The monumental amount of spirit slash spirit of life on the planet had suppressed the elemental presence, and a lot of flora and fauna had started to grow. The thing is, the element of spirit has a specific effect on flora and fauna. It accelerates growth, evolution, adaptation. Think about what happens to the Gorm that don't naturally ingest anima and what happens to them when they do. They get bigger, more aggressive, and if they find a potent enough source of anima, they gain sentience. This is exactly what happened on Draenor, except the creatures that became highly aggressive were described as a carnivorous invasive strain of plant, and just overall, they were a thousand times more effective and dangerous than the Gorm. Fun side note, in one of the weekly dungeon quests, a broker describes the potential uses of the Gorm. One of these uses is as a weapon, as in leave a few on a planet, allow them to breed, and watch the carnage. But anyway, back to the spore mounds. These plants, due to their exposure to spirit, went from creating vast and diverse ecosystems that spanned Draenor in search of sustenance, aka the creatures of Draenor, to ravenous living mountains of tangled brambles and noxious pods that eventually tapped into Draenor's elemental energies directly while looking for water. When these plants started to feed off these potent energies directly, the final transformation happened. Sentience. These carnivorous plant mountains, ecosystems, spore mounds, literally gained, and I quote, a communal sentience. Hive mines. These living hive mines, which encompassed all of the flora on Draenor, and it did connect to other separate hive mines, were called the Evergrowth. Koth. Basically the Green Black Empire. Now, with everything I've said so far, does a bunch of living, shadow-corrupted mounds of flesh creating bugs and fleshy abominations and feeding off the elements and a world soul make a lot more sense now? And if the Titans did figure out a way to reverse the corruption of certain plants, does the origin of most of Azeroth's plant life and the Emerald Nightmare's effectiveness and persistence also make sense? I mean, I would really like to go into fossil archaeology and explain how revealing those artifacts are when cross-referenced with the concepts of the spore mounds and Draenor's flora, but every time I try, it takes nearly two hours. So I'm really hoping at this point the idea of a shadow-corrupted ecosystem slash spore mound slash evergrowth turning into an old god is quite solidly understood, because that is my base understanding of what the old gods are highly dangerous living ecosystems that were corrupted by the shadow, that eventually became unrecognizable as plants and turned into the fleshy mounds that we know as the old gods. 
With that said, I can imagine there are a few people disappointed at this explanation, especially considering the Stulu cosmic horror aspects that have been connected to the old gods and the fun possibilities surrounding those ideas. The old gods just being angry plants does seem to take away from the grandeur of their villainy. With that said, I'm in the opposite camp. As I mentioned before, this explanation simultaneously explains the old gods, but also makes them incredible enigmas. And honestly, where we may understand one aspect of their story, there is still so much more to understand. For example, if the old gods' forms are just shadow corrupted plants, okay, but what corrupted the plants in the first place? Or more interestingly, what part of the ecosystem was corrupted? And could this explain the fifth old god? Or on a more speculative note, who is actually in control of these ecosystems? My main reason for making this content, other than it being overdue, is that in the Hidden History of the Drust, I mentioned the idea that Yogg-Saron may have been a podling, and or something akin to them, and I was adamant that Nazoth was basically a squid. The reason why I mention these is because if my understanding of the Old Gods is correct, then there is a very real chance that it's possible to figure out what specific parts of each respective ecosystem were corrupted by the Shadow and eventually turned into the Old Gods. Or in Azoth's case, what may have taken over these ecosystems. So, from the top, following the line of lore related to Nazoth's origin, we start with Draenor fishing. Yes, Draenor fishing. There is a fish on Draenor called a Fire Amnite. An Ammonite, just for reference, is basically a squid. The reason the Fire Ammonite caught my attention is because they are fished out of lava. The implication being that in some way these squids are some form of elemental. Skipping over to Azeroth fossil archaeology, there is the twisted Ammonite shell which reads as follows. Ammonites are an extinct type of shelled squid. The shell can be long like a spear or coiled in a variety of different ways. While this fossil is of a small specimen, they could grow quite large. So, it turns out, Ammonites existed on Azeroth. We then get this artifact from fossil archaeology, imprint of a Kraken tentacle. These gigantic squid are servants of Neptune the Tidehunter, and normally dwell in the Abyssal Moor, and not on Azeroth. The fact this imprint is fossilized in ancient stone suggests that the mighty creatures have been visiting this world for millennia. Now, with a little inference, I feel like it's safe to say we just got confirmation that the Ammonites on Azeroth were also some form of elemental, specifically water elementals, and that they likely turned into Kraken when they grew larger, and the reason why they went extinct probably had something to do with the Black Empire and or the creation of the elemental plane. So, at this point we have two types of elemental Ammonites, one of water, one of fire, but overall elementals that we know can eventually evolve into more complex creatures, as shown by the history of the Prodrakes. Moving back to Wad, we then run into the Amorphic Cognitors, squid that likely evolved into the creatures we see due to exposure to the element of spirit and or some form of magic. And what do you know? On Azeroth, we have the Merciless, and where they are quite specifically related to Shadow Magic on Azeroth, the Merciless basically share identical traits to the Amorphic Cognitors. And also, another fun fact. A possible simplification of Amorphic Cognitor is Shapeless Protector, and just in case that hasn't clicked, Faceless, Naraki. Who do they serve? What do they protect? I'm hoping the similarities and the concept of how the Merciless are basically facehuggers, or at least worse facehuggers, is starting to make sense. Because from here we come back to what I mentioned in Hidden History of the Drust and the likely evolutionary diversion of the Merciless into Zotaroids and Kraken depending on their exposure to magic, and Azoth being a byproduct of a lot of shadow corruption a long time ago, and or just overall. If the Void Lords did truly have issues manifesting their power in the physical universe, then corrupting small creatures in an ecosystem and working their way up the food chain is an incredibly smart way to spread that corruption without being noticed. And from a storytelling point, it also allows you to incorporate all the aspects of the game in storytelling, aka another reason why battle pet lore is rather interesting and can be quite revealing. But anyway, with Nzoth being the proof of concept, the next old god was really easy. Yasharaj, god of seven heads. It could be a metaphorical name considering the Shah, however, I think it's a literal name, and with that assumption, Mandragora, literal plant hydras, 
seemingly spawned from vines, fit the possible origins of Yashiraj quite nicely. As in other than being a Hydra, and a plant creature, Mandragora seem to be the apex predators of primal ecosystems, outside of the sentient creatures. This possible position in the food chain likely explains Yashiraj's dominance on Azeroth. That said, marsh walkers may be the exception to that rule, but even then they don't seemingly share the same ecosystems. And actually, speaking of marsh walkers, just to do my due diligence, it is possible Yashiraj may actually be connected to these apex predators instead of hydras. How so? Well, marsh walkers turn up in Ardenweald. However, in Ardenweald, they are called silk striders. And it turns out these creatures originated from silkworms. Don't ask me how, but that is a thing. And funnily enough, with this being the case, Strange Velvet Worm, an artifact from Cataclysm, suddenly makes a lot more sense, as well as the Naga's connection to these creatures considering I doubt spiders were the only source of silk for the highborn. But anyway, this possibility explains the serpent-like nature of Yashiraj, yet Yashiraj seemingly being divorced from serpents, and actually overall relates him to the Yormunga worms. So, that's two old gods' origins. Moving to Seethun and Yoxron, their origins are still incredibly difficult to figure out. I assume Seethun may have been a lasher, the assumption being that its eye is an impressive display of magical control and projection. The only thing that even remotely proves this, however, is the fact that we fight Seethun inside its stomach, and there is only one plant-based creature that fits the description of being all stomach. A lasher. As for Yorxeron, I originally assumed he may have been some form of crab spider considering his seeming connection to the Nerubians and the Makura. With that said, I eventually settled on him possibly being a podling, and or possibly a warped amalgamation of podlings, because they both share two key traits. The first trait being the Moors. Yorxeron's body is basically an amalgamation of Moors, looking to feed on whatever gets close. The podlings are basically the same bar being amalgamated together. Instead, they act like a swarm of land piranha overwhelming whatever they choose to feast on. The other trait, which for me was the dead giveaway, is that both are incredibly deceptive. Yogg and his deceptions need no introduction. What Yogg'saron managed to do with Loken speaks volumes to how cunning the old god is. The Podlings, however, you don't really see their deception until Wad and the Gloomshade grow where they literally convince you to walk deep into their territory with the express intent of eating you alive. This is a shockingly notable trait because pretty much none of the other plant life on Draenor, even the Batani, attempt such a feat. Couple this with the fact we fight inside Yoxron's brain, and the podlings looking like they're designed to just be a head, and the overall similarities add up, even though I will admit they are a bit sketchy. So, assuming everything I've said so far is correct, then the old gods we fought, or more precisely, their forms, likely originated from a Lasher, Mandragora, an Ammonite, and something akin to a Podling, and over time, due to the corruption of the Void Lords and Shadow Magic, they grew into the massive horrors we fought. Here's the thing though, if these creatures are the original forms of the old gods, then as I mentioned, the questions of when and who corrupted them comes to mind, as well as who is in control. And where I know that may seem like a self-explanatory answer considering most of the lore we already know, I want to challenge that knowledge by pointing out the dungeon that really got me thinking about this. Seat of the Triumvirate, the dungeon that was introduced in 7.3, that we knew was going to have some important lore inside considering it was introduced during a patch. In the case of Seat of the Triumvirate, the forefront of the story focuses on Illyria and how she absorbs the Shadow Naru's power and gains her shadow form. In the background of this story, however, there are some very interesting implications made about shadow magic, which raise a plethora of questions when you think about the old gods. What am I talking about? Well, basically, Sea of the Triumphorate seems to go out of its way to show that not all creatures of the shadow want into the physical universe. Not only that, though, it also goes out of its way to show that where the creatures of the shadow are dangerous, Creatures from the physical universe wielding shadow magic are just as dangerous and can also quite easily be the cause of void incursions of their own volition. No whispers or madness required. Now, at this point, considering everything I've been through so far, from Spore Mounts to the origins of the old gods, I'm hoping the question of 
who is really in control has started to sink in. Because when I personally started to reflect on what we already know about the old gods after considering all of this, most of the information we have seems to be either superficial, contradictory, or implicitly begs questions about other factors that might be at play. For example, we have one description of the Void Lords and the Old Gods' intent being the consumption and destruction of everything in the universe, and we even have the story of the Ethereals, Dementius, and Koresh to back this up. Yet we also have the apparent reason why the Old Gods were created, which was out of jealousy on the Void Lords' part, because the Titans could create life, which, strangely enough, was actually backed up in Nihilotha by the Moor of Gormar and Ilganoth. How so? Well, from the top down, the boss chambers of the Moor of Gormar were the Moor itself, which contained a chamber for Shaddaa the Insatiable, a room that literally contained the equivalent of stomach bile, the War of Decay, where we fight Drestigath, who, for a lack of a better description, seems to be what happens when intestines get really, really angry, and where I know you can imagine what comes next, this is where things get weird. On the last floor, we get the spawning chamber just outside the Chamber of Rebirth, which contained Ilganoth who, throughout his fight, keeps talking about his perfect body. You dare scar perfection! The Moor of Gormar seems to be an incredibly twisted attempt at creating slash rebirthing life, which fundamentally contradicts the Void Lord's apparent purpose of consuming everything. This isn't mentioning in Ward we learn thanks to the Pillars of Fate, the physical universe seemingly has an atrophying effect on creatures of shadow, which makes them incredibly weak when they enter the physical universe. Now, admittedly, this could be thanks to the magic of order, or it's a phenomenon that could give an explanation behind the Void Lord's need to constantly feed in the physical universe, but even then, it raises the question of why would they want into the physical universe in the first place? Is the ability to create life that important to them, or are they genuinely that spiteful? And I haven't even mentioned the enemy infiltration preface, which seems to indicate the Shadow is apparently more preoccupied with seeing the future and its thousand truths than anything else. Not forgetting to mention, it seems as if the Nathrazim have set up the Shadow to be the enemy of basically every magic, whether they are the true threat or not. And that's just the Shadow end of these questions. Remember what the Swarm Hounds managed to do? As in tap into magics, gain sentience, etc, etc? Here's a question for you. Do you think a plant that is practically eating everything cares what type of magic it consumes? Or do you think it's just going to adapt to consume that magic? The only magic in World of Warcraft I cannot see plants willingly consuming is fell magic. Yet Felwood of the Tainted Forest, in particular the Tainted Forest, and the second boss of Cathedral of Eternal Night say otherwise. Not forgetting to mention, considering I keep mentioning this line way too much, Life is seemingly as deceptive as death, which once again, I cannot overstate the fact that line likely came from an astrazine, which is the equivalent of receiving a compliment from a master in a field of work for doing that field of work. But more importantly, in my opinion at least, it's completely believable life is as deceptive as death. Or at the very least, it's believable when it comes to nature in the physical universe. A myriad of primal related zones in Ward display how dangerous nature can be and its ability to mimic and adapt to whatever it encounters. I mean, to put the really quacked stuff out there, I think it's very possible life may have screwed over a certain and possibly large portion of the shadow. As in, there may have been those in the shadow that wanted to create life. And through a very nasty set of circumstances, life may have been able to get a significant portion of the shadow's power and possibly trap them slash that power in the physical universe. Why you ask? Well, if the Swarm Hounds and even the Drust being a third party assimilating into nature are anything to go by, it's rather obvious life has aspects within it which are far from pure and only care about consumption and power. The shadow is a magic after all, so why not use it as a power source? And what I think would be an utterly brilliant and terrifying twist is that all of those shadow worlds we saw in Legion weren't actually the shadow, but something from life that's hijacked the shadow. I mean, as twists go, it would also be a rather interesting reveal if the thing that landed on Faizandi definitely fit the description of an old god, and may have actually been an old god, but in reality, the shadow wasn't in control. Something else was. 
but that's a quite possibility related to this concept. Overall, I've hopefully explained what I think the old gods are, where I think the old gods and Azeroth have originated from, and clarified that where these may be explanations, there are frankly still way more questions than answers when it comes to the old gods. Thank oh right. The fifth old god, I almost forgot. Okay, so before Chronicle Volume 3, there were, to our knowledge, four confirmed old gods. This number of old gods also just happened to perfectly match the number of swarm mounds that had appeared on Draenor. So overall, the assumption I was working off was the four swarm mounds corresponded with the four old gods in Astral. And the described ecosystems of each spore mound gave an insight into the old gods on Azeroth. And where Tala, the fourth spore mound on Draenor, was created from a fossilized root of one of the original three spore mounds, its story, for the most part, just left interesting speculation around how one of the old gods may have been created and how one of them may return. Then, Chronicle 3 happened. On the cover page of Chronicle 3, we are shown an image of creatures that are quite likely the old gods. The surprise of this image, however, is that there are five old god-like creatures, not four. So, the implication seems to be that there were five old gods in Azeroth at some point, not just four. Obviously, with this revelation, there were a lot of questions. The joke was, even more questions arose as leaks about Cahoon being a thing started to appear around this time. So considering all the information given at the time, there seemed to be indications that there were actually six old gods. Now, Cahoon being an old god got crushed pretty quickly with further leaks, for as it turned out, Cahoon was an experiment of the Titans, and if Cahoon was going to fit into the old god category, he would be considered an artificial old god. Cahoon was likely created in the same manner as Tala, however, what the Titans specifically did to create Cahoon is still up in the air. Here's the thing though. If Tala and Gahoon have a relatively equal equivocation in their creation, this throws off the Spore Mound Old God equivocation I mentioned earlier. And so now we only have three original Spore Mounds and one artificial Spore Mound, and five original Old Gods and one artificial Old God. The numbers don't match, and where it would be completely fair to say I'm focusing on these equivocations way too much, called it Quacked Feral Insight or Feral Quacked Insight, I'm certain the Spore Mounds and the cut content of Faralan in Ward were supposed to connect the Spore Mounds and the Old Gods, to the point where I would never need to make this content. So if there are five Old Gods, I am certain there were five Spore Mounds on Draenor. And where at first I couldn't find anything and stopped looking, I eventually ran into a coincidence that explained a lot. The Spies of Iraq. The whole zone has mountains designed in a very peculiar way. The reason why is because the Spires of Iraq weren't originally Spires, they were a Spire, as in singular. During the Arakoa Civil War, the monumentally tall landmark, the Spire of Iraq, was destroyed. Now initially, the only other place I noticed that seemed to mimic such a design were the trees of Talador, but honestly that didn't make much sense because the trees in that forest likely ended up that way thanks to the Batani that raised Tala in the area and they were direct enemies of the Arakoa. Then, as I was reading Chronicle Volume 2 and flying over Frostfire Ridge, it finally hit me and my oversight was revealed. In Chronicle Volume 2, there are actually four Spore Mounds mentioned. The three that fight Grond, Zhang, Botan, and Nanu, as well as the unnamed one. The one that Grond tore out of Draenor and sparked the creation of the three moving Spore Mounds that would eventually fight him. Now, my thoughts initially went to where did this spore mound die? Because each spore mound left the zone on Draenor. Initially, I started thinking the zone may have been the Spires of Iraq, and the remains of the dead spore mound may have been petrified over time and turned into the spire. But that's when I started to notice the stone formations of Frostfire Ridge. Spires of stone inexplicably reaching for the sky. Not just volcanoes, but literally twisted, pointed stone reaching for nothing. What would cause that? Not only that though, the blood maw and blades by ogres, one of fire and earth and the other of air and water, seemingly changed due to their exposure to the elements. Not forgetting to mention, Frostfire Ridge has scarce pockets of nature and no primals. Every other zone on Draenor feels the presence of the primals, yet Frostfire Ridge is seemingly the exception. It's almost as if the zone is naturally dead. 
At this point, I hope it's clicked. Frostfire Ridge is likely the location Grond tore out the original Swarm Hound, and in the process, turned the zone into a frozen, uninhabitable wasteland, only suitable to those that can weather the scarce conditions and the elements. The pointed stone is likely the dead and petrified roots of the Swarm Mound, giving even more context to how big Grond and these Swarm Mounds were and also explaining why mineral-rich lava constantly pours out of the zone. What happened when Amunthul tore Yasharaj out of Azeroth? He created an unhealable scar that bled Azeroth, which, considering everything we know now, likely constituted a lot of Azerite, an incredibly powerful mineral. And where I know Draenor doesn't have the exact equivalent of Azerite, we know the lava has powerful properties because of the Doomhammer, which is made of the stuff. And using a bit of intuition, the Blood Maul Ogres and the Ring of Blood and Frostfire Ridge, which is just an area surrounded by lava, suddenly make a lot more sense. And where I know this has only given us four original Swarm Mounds on Draenor, with the notion that these massive roots have the potential to turn to stone after the Swarm Mound has apparently died, which is actually something corroborated in Dwarven archaeology, the overall history of the Spire of Rark becomes a very interesting point of lore, considering if the pillar of apparent rock was that large and existed during the era of the first small mounds, it's kind of strange it's not mentioned, and or it's kind of strange that it's not the mountain that Grond was created out of, which then, considering the other well-known bits of lore about the spire, leads to the Arakoa, who are technically birds, and it just happens that two out of three of their gods are also birds, and so with this in mind, I have to wonder about the possible similarities between them and the story of the wild god Aviana, mistress of birds, and the world tree Gahania, the mother tree. And where I know the statement slash question is going to be, isn't Gahania dead? So are you saying the fifth old god is dead? The short answer is yes. Technically. Kind of. Probably not for long. Why? Well, fun fact, Resto Druids were carrying around a branch of Garhania, all of Legion, and in the information given about Garhania in the Order Hall, it's mentioned Aviana has been attempting to restore the tree since Cataclysm. So yeah, assuming my understanding of how the Old Gods are formed and their connection to the Swarm Mounds is accurate, we may have at least partially confirmed what slash who the fifth Old God was and how it may return while also raising a crazy amount of questions about what actually happened to this old god, and how it ended up becoming the mother tree of Azeroth, and with its destruction, almost destroyed Azeroth entirely. And I mean, thinking about it, Yasharaj, Yuxaron, Seethun, Nizoth, and Gahania. Jeez, it's in the naming scheme. And on top of that, when you consider we have the Batali on the loose on Azeroth, crazed extinction-minded keepers turning up in BFA, possibly some really weird connections between the Shadowlands, the Razorfen, and the Quillbore, Thross, as well as the Drust turning themselves into Patani, I'm starting to think that possibility of an Emerald Dream X pack I mentioned in History of the Drust, or at least a patch, is a lot more likely than I first thought. Thank you for watching.